Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Agon Homza. I am here with my friend and colleague, uh, Frank Ruda, uh, my co-host of uh, the Christ and Critique podcast, Philosophy and its uh, Other Sea. Uh, after a break, we are very happy to return with our autumn season, uh, in which we will have, we hope, monthly uh, episodes with a series of uh, distinguished uh, guests. But before I introduce uh, our guest for today, I would like to mention a few things. First, the next issue of Christ and Critique, of the journal Christ and Critique, uh, comes out in uh, just a few days. The topic of this issue is uh, comedy and uh, tragedy. The second thing is we would like to ask you to uh, subscribe to our YouTube uh, and Spotify, uh, Spotify channels. Also, we have launched a Patreon page, so if you like what we do with our journal and uh, the podcast, please consider supporting us. You can find both links in the description uh, below. And now back to uh, our guest, whom I have the great uh, pleasure of introducing. Uh, Frank and I are very proud to welcome Robert Pippin to Christ and Critique uh, podcast. Robert uh, Pippin is the Evelyn Stephenson Neff Distinguished uh, Service Professor at the University of Chicago. He is a uh, winner of the Mellon Distinguished Achievement Award in the Humanities. He is a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences of the American Philosophical uh, Society and is a member of uh, the German National uh, Academy of uh, Sciences. He is the author of many books, and here uh, we will mention only a few. Uh, Hegel's uh, Idealism, The Satisfaction of Self-Consciousness, uh, The Persistence of Subjectivity on uh, the Kantian uh, Aftermath, Hegel's Practical Philosophy, Rational Agency as Ethical uh, Life, Hegel's Realm of Shadow, Logic as Metaphysics in uh, Hegel's Science of Logic. Then a book on uh, modernist art after the beautiful, published in 2013, and many books on film and uh, philosophy. His latest include uh, Metaphysical Exile, uh, Exile on GM uh, Kodze, Jesus uh, Fictions, Douglas Sirk, uh, filmmaker and philosopher, and Philosophy by Other Means, The Art in Philosophy and Philosophy in the Arts. And he has a new book coming out in uh, January 2024 called uh, The Culmination, Heidegger, German Idealism and the Fate of uh, Philosophy. As seen from uh, his book, uh, Pippin's work is mainly focused on in German uh, idealism, most notably in Kant and Hegel. And uh, without a doubt, in the world of Hegel studies, uh, his name uh, costs a long uh, shadow. He is, uh, rightly so, considered uh, to be one of the most original readers of Hegel and of German uh, idealism in general. His originality goes further. His work on aesthetics, film theory, literature, and art in general are uh, equally original and uh, innovative. But I will not go uh, on any longer, and I will hand uh, things over to my friend Frank to start off our conversation with Robert Pippin. Robert, thank you so much for being here with us uh, tonight. Thank you for inviting me. I'm glad to be here. Um, thanks for, for, for starting this and introducing Robert. Thank you um, for taking the time and uh, the energy to, to do this with us, Robert. Um, it's an indeed a, 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 a full moment pleasure. Um, to begin immediately uh, in media's race uh, and with a question regarding uh, one of your books that has not yet even seen the light of day, namely um, the the book um, Agon just referred to the culmination Heidegger German idealism and the fate of philosophy, which is um, um, I think scheduled to appear with University Press uh, University of Chicago Press in uh, for January next year. Um, you begin this book, which you were kind enough um, to share with us, the manuscript of which you were kind enough to share with us. You begin it by indicating that one of the few fellow thinkers, one of the few comrades, so to speak, that you find in the history of philosophy, someone with a take similar, at least in this respect, a comrade, to your approach to Hegel is surprisingly or not Martin Heidegger. Um, the reason for this is that Heidegger, in his reading of Hegel, also took absolutely seriously that Hegel identified metaphysics with logic. 
i.e. he identified an account of being with an account of pure thinking. Heidegger sees in this very identification the culmination of a problematic tendency in the entire Western history of philosophy. And you indicate that the identification of being with what is intelligible, even knowable to us, and here lies the emphasis, is somewhat problematic. And it is problematic as it appears to reduce Hegel's position to a cliche and even possibly wrong, I for one would say it's possibly wrong, uh, version of Kant. Uh, can you tell us more about what is at stake in this discussion for you and how it frames the background uh, for the overall argument uh, that you unfold in the uh, upcoming book? Well, I'll, I'll try. I mean, there's a lot, you have to have a lot of sort of heavy metaphysical balls in the air to to sort of get Hegel and Heidegger into the same conversation without um, everybody's head blowing up. Uh, uh, the terminology is very difficult and the, the the approach is extremely extremely abstract. Let me let me start with um, what you first mentioned, which is um, my interest in seeing that in in uh, Heidegger's book Identity and Difference, a, a publication of some of his um, uh, seminar classes, especially in the last essay on onto theology. Um, uh, he he insisted that the really distinctive feature of, um, as you said, the, the distinctive feature of the most important book in Hegel's over the, the science of logic, uh, Hegel had uh, not only um, identified, helped us to see uh, the full implications of the ancient maxim that to be was to be intelligible, uh, that that is the mark of being. Um, but he had brought it to a kind of culmination. Uh, so, I mean, roughly, it's not a Kantian position because there's nothing outside the realm of thinking. Um, there, there's no thing in itself. There's no boundary to the um, conceptual intelligibility of the world. But um, what was really interesting about Heidegger is, although he understood why Hegel, why Hegel thought that, that any account of thinking uh, that could account for it being able to be onto objects, uh, also at the same time delimited what could be an object in the world. So the identity of thinking and being doesn't mean that being is really thought or that thinking knows everything that there is to know about being. It, it's at the level of categoriality that whatever is necessary for thought to be thought, that is to say to be determinately onto whatever thought is about, is also necessary as a condition for any object in the world to be the determinate thing it is and distinguishable from anything else. There's a famous, wonderful phrase by the late um, ancient scholar Arya Kozman that since Aristotle, predication is the face of being, that the logical intelligibility of the world is its discursive intelligibility in essentially in, in judgment. But, but what was interesting is that Heidegger had a different take on what that's all about. Um, for, for Heidegger, what um, what Hegel was in fact saying is, and we go now into the, the, the deepest depth of Heidegger, the, the central question of all philosophy is the meaning of being. So the, the first thing I had to do in the book was disagree that Heidegger is asking any kind of question about a definitional account of what it means to exist as opposed to not exist, or um, any account of the semantics of the copula, or what, what he was trying to say about Heidegger as a culmination is that since the Greek enlightenment, um, the, the meaning of being is not for um, Heidegger a semantic issue. It's, it's a question of what he called bedeutsamkeit, significance, mattering, importance. So what he was really interested in in, in Hegel was not so much the, uh, the metaphysical account of the identity of thinking and being, but the fact that he uh, Hegel represented for Heidegger the culmination of an account of the meaning of being where Zinn des Seins or the meaning of being is primarily understood in terms of saliences of significance, meaning in terms of meaningfulness. So for, for Heidegger, Hegel's claim that um, the absolute is the concept. <laughs> so for those of you who are amateur Hegelians just have to trust me that that means something. The, the absolute is the, the concept, um, is, is essentially 
uh, the claim that what matters in the availability of anything in our experience is primarily its salience, its, its mattering in a certain way, its significance. So he's saying that in Greek, since Greek metaphysics, since Plato and Aristotle essentially, uh, our, our entire relationship to the world, that is to say, our, our sense of being at home in the world, is primarily driven by our sense of the world's availability as a knowable object. That rational knowability is our reconciliation with the world, our sense that we are at home in it. It makes sense to us. It makes sense to us in discursive predicative modalities. Um, uh, and that, that in from, from being in time on, Heidegger is trying to say that the original availability of the world is not as perceptual objects reflecting light rays or not merely by virtue of our perceptual and co conceptual capacities working, but our experience is fundamentally, that is in terms of what shows up for us, a matter of, of, of this salience in, in mattering degrees of significance. I mean, in being in time, there's this famous analysis of tools and the way they show up for us in non-discursive ways by virtue of the projects we're engaged in and how they fit into it. So questions like that were quite limited in being in time. Then he went on to this larger project of the meaning of being in in, in the West. Um, now, this whole question of bedeutsamkeit or mattering, that, this, uh, this represents a quite a different interpretation of Hegel um, than even than, than mine. I mean, I, 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 I was inside Hegel world and was just trying to explain that the concept being the absolute is not is not unintelligible that Hegel is actually trying to trying to say if the task of philosophy is to help us understand how beings are available in their intelligibility we have to consider seriously the possibility of completing that task of there being an absolute that is to say the completion of the conditions under which anything could be available intelligibly that's that's the essential Hegelian project in the science of logic. But Heidegger is saying, well, now you're you're sort of missing the question. You you've forgotten something. The the, the question is not um, whether that's true or not in a sense, but how it has come to matter so much to us. Why why has in the Western tradition the consequences of Greek rationalism become the defining feature of our understanding of our being in the world? I mean, you could argue that that's not true. There's religion and so forth. And, but uh, according to Heidegger, if you just if you look at the trajectory of modern post Greek rationalism up to and including the scientific revolution and the transformation of the scientific revolution into the technological world that we live in, there's a continuity. And the continuity is not a matter of, of a sort of metaphysical truth, but uh, a continuity in what has come to count in the West as of utmost significance, the discursive rational intelligibility of the of the world. Now, in in any one of these answers, if I'm going on too long, just interrupt me because I don't I don't find it easy to answer your question without this little speech about um, the, the the way in which I understand Hegel and now what I found so interesting in 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 Heidegger. Um, uh, we don't tend to think of these issues of how things have come to matter to us as being subject for a philosophical interpretation. They, they're contingent. They, what matters to one person doesn't matter to another person. There's no, no general. Uh, and besides, mattering itself is not that special a, a deal. We value things because we have reasons for valuing them. So in the contemporary West, someone might value very, very highly control of um, the elements that are contributing to climate change, uh, uh, the destruction of the planet. And they think they that matters to them because they have good reasons for it mattering since the planet is on the verge of death, <laughs> it's a complete collapse. Um, but it, it takes just a moment to realize that in developing economies, uh, that doesn't matter. But they, they don't have the luxury of it matter. Uh, it's, you know, in China and India and Southeast Asia and any, any number of developing economies in the world, the idea, especially in China, the idea that they should give up coal and regress 100 years in their industrial uh, industrialization 
uh, doesn't make any sense to them. It can't fit into the world of matter in, in the way it does for them. So uh, Heidegger wants to say that underneath what seems to us to be the sort of subjective projection of value onto the world, there is a kind of horizon of matter in which Heidegger calls the world, uh, in which we find ourselves thrown, uh, and which has various dimensions that aren't really subject to rational legislation as to whether it should be valuable or not. So this whole question of mattering meaningfulness, the sources of meaningfulness in the world, um, and its primordiality in our experience is the major break between Heidegger and the Western intellectual tradition. Um, Heidegger thinks I'm asking a question, and this is debatable. I mean, he could sort of say, isn't this in Hegel in some way? Isn't it in Kant in some way? I mean, Kant, for Kant, all that really matters is autonomous self-legislation, the moral law. For Hegel, it's the realization of freedom. But Heidegger is trying to say, you know, underneath that, there is this continuous assumption that our basic relation to the world is cognition. And that's not a, a sort of matter of philosophical fact. It's a matter of what counts to us most as mattering. I mean, the old, the old Greek maxim was that the cosmos was good. The entire cosmos was good because the cosmos is available to what we need from it. It's in principle, complete intelligibility. And Hegel, if anybody, as a proponent of the idea of everything in principle being completely intelligible in the logic of all possible account givings, it's Hegel. So when Heidegger says Hegel is the culmination, I, I, he's, he's quite right. Uh, and of course, the next things are, what does it mean for Hegel's account to have failed? What does he mean by that? And why does Heidegger think the failure of this philosophical enterprise is responsible for such catastrophic consequences? The chief label for which in Heidegger is, is nihilism. So I became convinced in the book that um, the, the kind of trajectory of Western modernization and its, its under support by the modern sciences and modern philosophy might be approached in a different way if we understood Heidegger in a way that not many Heideggerians understand Heidegger as giving priority, not just in the sort of being in the world analysis of Suhan and Zion and so forth and being in time, but by looking at his post being in time insistence on the depth of the question of the meaning of being and it's being ignored in the Western tradition in ways that have consequences that lead to a kind of critique of the Western technological gestell. But, but that's, not, that's not a very adequate answer to your question, but that's the trajectory of the book. Uh, you end this very book uh, with a chapter on poetic thinking. Uh, Heidegger uh, famously indicated that philosophy's means of articulating the oblivion constitutive of and manifesting in Western thought are fundamentally limited. Uh, in a sense, the philosophical diagnosis that there is a problematic indifference, a forgetting of the constitutive difference between uh, being and beings in the world is also received with indifference. And this is what actually turned nihilism into proper nihilism. Uh, translated into more uh, trivial uh, words, people do not care what uh, philosophy says and also uh, not if it tells the people about uh, nihilism within uh, the world. This is uh, an essential part of uh, nihilism, which is why one needs to find a different mode of uh, articulation. And then, and that then is identified with uh, poetry. Uh, but you indicate uh, that we have to be quite careful what we mean by poetry here in the first uh, place. So could you elucidate for us uh, what is happening in this move to uh, to poetry? You indicated po uh, that poetry and thinking are closely aligned. Uh, what does this do for the role of aesthetic or uh, art in relation to uh, to thinking? Some, for example, have suggested following Herder 
uh, that what results from such a move conceptually uh, is ultimately that aesthetics becomes first uh, philosophy, but this does not seem to be your take on it, or, uh, or, or is it? Yeah, um, I think um, Heidegger, in, in his analysis of the everyday, um, both both in being in time and in his lectures in the in the 30s of basic problems of phenomenology, the fundamental concepts of metaphysics, and even up to introduction to metaphysics in the early 30s, um, his problem with the everyday is um, it, it is not so much its indifference to philosophy uh, as its general thoughtlessness or conformism, or you know, in the language of being in time, subjection to das man or the they one, how one goes goes on. But in order to understand uh, the, your question you're asking about um, the, uh, the superiority of a kind of poetic thinking to discursive analysis of what's what's going wrong um, in in a society in which the primary feature of everyday life is is an indifference to the question of the meaning of their own being, one has to appreciate that Heidegger is radically changing the question of one's own being. And then his word for that, of course, is Dasein. Um, but he means to say, the first thing we have to understand about understanding ourselves, and this will eventually get to the question of poetry, um, is that we're not a substantive thing, that the, the dominant conception of being in the West, president hands, substances enduring in time. That's what it means. That's, that's what's important about being, that there are detectable presences that endure through time understood as a sequence of nows, that we can't understand ourselves that way. Um, that as, as a, for example, in an Aristotelian way, as a species form, or even in an early Marxist way, as a species being in his Aristotelian moments and something like that. Dasein is a unique experiential path through life, characterized distinctly by an awareness of an ever impending death, and with no substantive basis except self-interpretive projection for how one ought to live. So Dasein has this ex distinct experiential path through life. And then the second element necessary to answer your question is, um, is actually quite controversial and paradoxical. It's that people have come to misunderstand the very fundamental originary experience of the world that they actually experience. In other words, I mean, uh, one example with this would be a, a kind of self-deceit, um, or another example would be a Marxist ideology critique, that the self, honestly self-reported experiences of people, sincere self-reported experiences, are not adequately characterizing the experiences they actually have. I mean, they think that, in other words, they've come to understand what matters to them is the manipulability of the world for their own species interests, right? Um, but the source of that meaningfulness is hidden from them. They don't, in a way, especially appreciate that there is no substantive claim on which this particular relation to the world which is essentially a, ultimately a predatory relation to the world, um, has any foundation or basis. The, uh, nowadays, I think that modern science has taught us that where these complex, highly evolved, um, biologically sensitive centers of consciousness that have evolved species interests that play out in a way that we can explain. Yeah, all, Heidegger thinks of all of that as untrue to our experience of ourselves in time as creatures who are aware of their impending impending death. Now, the upshot of all of this is how do we understand ourselves now, and especially what's going wrong? I mean, how do we understand the, the widespread pathologies in especially Western Europe and North American societies, advanced uh, post-industrial societies? Um, if Dasein is what Heidegger says Dasein is, then an analysis based on um, something like, given the kind of creatures we are, we're living irrationally. We're not living in a way that realizes the objective capacities we have 
as the beings we have. And we do that because we're irrational and we need enlightenment about the capacities that we're underusing or not uh, allowing the full fruition that would make for a human life happy and fulfilled. Um, all of that goes out the window we, we, because uh, it's just naive to think that what, what, what Western societies need is enlightenment. <laughs> if, everybody, if everybody could be made aware of how stunted and restricted human life is under late post-industrial global finance capitalism, ah, they would, you know. So um, what we need to understand about ourselves are, are both how things have come to matter in their interrelated dimensions in a world that really can't be an object of analysis. The, the world is the horizon for whatever comes to matter in analysis. Then, then the issue of poetic disclosure comes in. We need, uh, because Heidegger thinks we want the truth about ourselves, but the truth about ourselves isn't formulatable in propositions asserted in judgments. We're not that kind of being. We need to understand how things have come to matter in the way they've mattered, and especially how they come to fail to matter. <clears throat> so nowadays, after a after hundred years of, of existentialism, it sounds you know, cliched or banal to say that what the, the crisis in the West is a crisis of meaningfulness or something like that. Um, it, you know, the, the book by uh, Sean Kelly and Bert Dreyfus had tried to say that. I mean, there's, there's nothing in it that's not true. It just ends up saying it's sounding banal if you can't give some more depth to the issue. That's why I think Heidegger's larger project on the meaning of being is necessary for a book like that to work. But it, the, the basic claim is that our access to what we need to know about ourselves is not a matter of propositional truth, but a matter of what Heidegger calls disclosure, unhiddenness, aletheia, untergorgenheit. Um, we, great art, not just you know actual lyric poetry or something like that, but um, the uh, the capacity of the nineteenth century novel um, or the or twentieth century film. Um, to disclose under the demand of interpretive finesse in reading and understanding the works, um, what's happening to us might be able to disclose something about the state of the late modern world in a way that uh, a sociological analysis or an anthropological analysis or a neurobiological analysis is completely inadequate for because how things are for us is not accessible from a third person sideways on view. Um, the, the great sort of moment of phenomenology in Husserl that to return to the life world is to return to some way of gaining access to a first personal understanding in a, in a particular historical horizon. And novels, plays, poems, artworks, films. I mean, I'm, I'm getting up to your, your question about Herder that well, aren't you sort of saying that first philosophy now is some? Well, I wouldn't say aesthetics, because um, that's by and large a subfield of philosophy that is about what is art and is there art, not art. And it's become a kind of trivialized, very, very minor and unimportant. You can't get a job if you're if you come out of graduate school and your specialty is aesthetics. You're not going anywhere. It's like being a specialist in philosophy of religion or something. These fields have just collapsed within the American and European Academy, nobody does aesthetics anymore. But uh, nevertheless, the idea that there's a philosophical profundity in the arts that philosophy can't do without, because we need also philosophical criticism, not just the arts. So something like that does seem to me the implication of Heidegger's project is one of the reasons why I started working more and more on artworks. And, I mean, uh, we can go further into this in your later questions about the state of continental analytic philosophy and so forth. But anyway, to your question of what 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 the implications are for, of Heidegger proposing as an alternative to systematic philosophy or critical philosophy, poetic thinking, that's the general background of the 
trajectory that would lead me or somebody to think we ought to pay a great deal more attention to the disclosure possible. Now, of course, philosophers object because disclosures don't have rigorous truth conditions. How do you know that what you're saying about what these films by Robert Bresson reveal about us is true? Should you put that in a proposition and then ask yourself what the truth conditions of the proposition? Well, that whole way of thinking, Heidegger is trying to junk and it doesn't think he invites the danger of arbitrariness and an indifference to truth or anything like that. I, I, I think I, I can quite quite directly connect to that because I mean, if let's say um, an articulation um, of um, 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 that experience of disclosure uh, cannot be articulated in propositional language um, that brings us very close to what Higo calls a speculative presentation or a speculative sentence, right? I mean, that works different from uh, a standard type of judgment, right? It's not simply a form of um, linking a subject with a predicate. It's not simply a predication, right? It, it, it operates differently by, by, let's say, I don't know, at least um, transforming um, the natural attitude that we have to speaking in a in a in a in a certain way, and and I mean just given the fact that you are, um, um, and uh, as Argon mentioned at the beginning, uh, without any doubt one of the most influential and impactful. I mean, not, I mean, in the UK, not in the UK sense of impact, but impactful uh, readers of Hegel today. Um, <clears throat> Um, you, 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 um, 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 could you tell us a bit more about why you think that exactly Hegel's position? I mean, we talked a lot about Heidegger, but can you tell us a bit more um, about why exactly Hegel today is especially informative for us? So, what is it that um, makes Hegel actually practically relevant today um, to unfold the consequences of? Well, I think the approach that you already delineated, right? I mean, it's not simply about um, forms of self-determination. Other thinkers could think that as well, but about a very specific rendering, very specific conditions of 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 self-determinations. I mean, you are also a world-renowned expert in Nietzsche. So, what um, what can make us what what can Hegel make us see, especially in the present, that that maybe Nietzsche cannot make us see, um, but it might be helpful to have Nietzsche in the picture as well. But but what is it? Let's stick with that. What can, especially today, um, um, Hegel make us make us uh, make us see, even against maybe standard renderings of Hegelianism, or me maybe even against. Hegel's own rendering of his own position, because you you often argue that Hegel has a potential that one can turn against Hegel's own presentation of his position. I mean, especially in the aesthetics and um, 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 so forth. Yeah, well, I, I'd actually be interested in what either of you would say about that. It's a very difficult question. I mean, I, I, I think there are a number of permanent achievements in Hegel's account of the modernization project in the West that I wouldn't want to I wouldn't want to junk. I mean, I mean the 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 real epochal making intervention by Hegel in philosophy is that philosophy is its own time comprehended in thought. That that seems to me a permanent achievement and a great break with the tradition of philosophy up to and including um, neo-Kantianism or post-Kantianism in the in the German idealist tradition. So that that seems to me a, a permanent. Um, unavoidable task for um, philosophy. His realism, his view that philosophy should not take itself to be proposing ideals that the world ought to measure up to. I mean, this is still what philosophy does, what what political philosophy does. So if you if you believe there's something significant in Hegel, you believe that enterprise is pointless. Uh, I mean, this is, you could say Hegel was the first critical theorist. He's the first one to try to argue that whatever the critique of a form of life emerging in a historical moment amounts to, it must appeal to 
elements in the form of life itself, the actual elements in the form of life itself that require the kind of reform or transposition or self-overcoming um, his yeah, and then so many individual his critique of the contractarian model of the state his critique of liberal atomistic individualism his critique of um the uh of essentially of of the primacy of liberal democracy as the only way of understanding a legitimate ethical community in the world um so uh these I, oh yeah, if, I think even more, especially than anything else, his insistence that the question of recht in a modern society um, is not it have it, it is only minimally a, a rights protection uh, kind of enterprise, uh, but that the the measure of the achievement of a rechtstaat is whether some experience in the community of mutuality of of respect mutuality of standing, the avoidance of humiliation and degradation in the everyday life world of those who have to work to survive. That, that emphasis on recognitive status as an internally demanded, not an, not an ideal based on some sort of metaphysical claim about human being, but uh, what the modern world has especially the post-Christian emphasis on on the sanctity of the individual that there's still the lesser kind of social requirement for mutuality of recognitives. So yeah, I'm just listing all the things that I think are not, not really affected by um, what we're really worried about with with Hegel. Now, however, the great problem is that Hegel's account of uh, early industrial society was based on a very limited picture of what was emerging in the industrialization of Europe, especially in England in the 19th century. He's talking about family owned farms, shop owners, craftsmen, tradesmen, almost a mercantile economy, a very small kind of very little, you know, international trade. But so and what, it, what Hegel saw coming was that there was a new relationship between masters and bondsmen emerging between the owners of capital and the uh, wage laborers, um, he thought could be contained, um, hence his opposition to the English Reform Bill. And uh, he, could, he could see, for example, there were already large agricultural corporations trying to buy up family farms in Germany. And it, Hegel was dead opposed to that. Uh, but it, you know, it was fingers in the dike kind of thing. He he really had no idea of um, what was coming, and most of his analysis in the philosophy of right, especially his analysis of what things like corporation, corporations could do, uh, is now inert. I mean, uh, Hegel thought that the cycles of production and um, recession in in modern capitalism could be mediated by these labor groups or unions or corporations that could take care of the workers, that there was a kind of family extension that could provide a buffer against the inevitable economic upheavals of capital. That, that, well, that turns out not to be true. I mean, it, it, there's still union life, but I wish there were a lot more of it, but um, it's, it's, you know, like under 20% of the American workforce and even the recent victories, you know, are are compromises with the existence of massive profiteering capitalism that really isn't affected by the the writer's strike or I mean I'm happy for the union workers but in in auto industry but uh, it's such a drop in the bucket compared to what General Motors is going to make over the next 50 or 60 years their share of the pie got a little bit bigger but the actual conditions of work and labor and the the control of their own future is is, is basically non-existent. Um, Anyway, modern Western society here, I mean, Modulo, all the things I said Hegel is still really important for. Modern Western societies no longer fit Hegel's analysis of his own time. Uh, and, you know, pretty seriously don't fit. So um, the, the question for me is, well, wait, let's go back to this Heideggerian account of what's behind it all. Um, 
is the reason it doesn't fit uh, is is Hegel complicit uh, in 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 even um, the sort of limited vision of the development of modern capitalism? What 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 Heidegger thinks is behind it a kind of the, the other the other way of saying Heidegger understands metaphysics as logic is that he understands the human subjection of the world to the requirements of Logos. Um, and that means one has to ask, is that true of Hegel? I mean, in, in a great book on this logic by Mikhail Toynesen, um, it, it, it emerges that um, Toynesen thinks uh, that that actually the, the basic teaching of the science of logic is a kind of hair shaft, kind of domination. Adorno thinks this as well, but he gets this without admitting it from Heidegger, the identity thinking problem and so forth. Um, but in any event, the, the, the question is, how complicit is Hegel in the dynamic of um, Western modernization since the Greeks that has led us to what Heidegger considers a catastrophic situation? Um, I'm not sure how to answer that at, uh, at, at the moment, because as I said at the beginning, there are a lot of things in Hegel that seem to me permanent achievements in philosophy and that it's still haven't been integrated into philosophy. I mean, there was a moment in which hermeneutics and the hermeneutics Habermas kind of thing in the 80s was a kind of prominent, but essentially the historically interpretive task of philosophy, who's doing that anymore? Off, off, you know, within critical theory, sure. Um, but uh, in terms of the kind of prominence we would require for there to be a collective effort to figure out what's going wrong with the, the way we're living. Um, we're, uh, philosophy, anyway, is still trapped into this kind of ideal theory. The world isn't measuring up to it, so it's irrational kind of approach. <clears throat> uh to continue with uh, this, uh, you fre uh, frequently and uh, critically engage with uh, influential readings of uh, of Hegel and uh, accounts of his uh, general uh, framework. Your engagement with uh, thinkers like Brandon uh, McDowell, but also Honath and uh, Zizek appeared in a volume entitled Interaminations, uh, Receiving Modern uh, German, uh, German Modern uh, uh, Philosophy. What seems to be uh, at stake in it is to inter alia clarify what is what it actually means uh, to today, and this is a modern today to conceive of German uh, idealist uh, thought. In the book, you also critically reconstruct, for for example, Slavoj Žižek's uh, position as presenting an ontology, or maybe more an uh, ontologization of the gap. Zizek here becomes for you the thinker of a gappy ontology. Gaps are gaps in the normative setup of, uh, of the world and intersubjective, intersubjective uh, practices that cannot be normatively accounted for and, and hence present something that appears problematic from uh, your persp perspective, if you understand uh, this uh, uh, correctly. Can you tell us more about uh, this reproach to Zizek and in what way you think uh, that this is a relate that this is related to the question that he repeatedly uh, raises, raises, namely the question of how the space of reason uh, is constituted in the first place, and with it the question of how we enter uh, into it. It leads him for you to a position that introduces, if we see this uh, correctly, something uh, like an like unexplained. Ex explainer that he is at least honest enough to identify as or account for for in his term of gaps what do you think there is something flawed in such an uh, account yeah again we're at a, a level of abstraction where the air is very thin um gappy ontologies uh uh, uh i mean behind your question is the problem of shelling uh, to introduce yet another ball into the air, um, and uh, and Zizek's uh, 
really excellent first book on showing tearing with the negative, uh, which is where all of this all of this started and all of it goes back to. Um, if you believe the following question is well posed uh, as a as a question, you're going to end up with the answer you were you were talking about. How is it that nature, let's say, understood as the most sophisticated physical, biological, neurological, biochemical sciences? With shelling of this chemistry, but with us, it's just this whole panoply of sciences that make up what we think of as nature. Um, how is it that that natural beings, um, uh, as you say, enter the space of reasons, um, begin to hold each other to account in ways that are no longer explicable by appeal to their natural properties? You, if you believe that question is well posed, the question is like sort of asking in the evolutionary history of the web, of, of, of the human species, what happened? And you're you're tempted to say there's just a gap there, which is essentially Schelling's Schelling's position. The 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 difference between the subjective and the objective is neither a subjective nor an objective position. It's something beyond them. The same thing with Herdelin, the same thing with this kind of prior to being, pr prior to the potential articulation of being, there is something that will never, you know, that's a gap <laughs> in, in our uh, articulability. Now, first of all, this, this cannot possibly apply to Hegel. Uh, the, the most radical anti-gap philosopher in history is Hegel. Um, as I say, the absolute is a concept. Everything makes sense. To be is to be intelligible. What Schelling is talking about is the night in which all cows are black. They're, you know, they're, that's just radical indeterminacy. And one indeterminacy is as good as any other indeterminacy. Um, so Hegel, Hegel is the opponent of this position. But it, 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 my, my view is that the question is wrongly posed. I mean, Heidegger is really, to some extent, the, the gap person here, um, although it, take, it would take a while to to really say why. L let me just say, uh, from the Hegelian point of view, the problem of how it happened is a, 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 a question that's posed on the level of an ontology of things. How did this one thing get to have this capacity, given the capacities we know it has? But Heidegger, uh, I think we were talking before about the Dasein as, as a non-thing-like construal of a distinct experiential path through a finite existence. What 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 th that kind of approach says is, well, at a certain development level in the evolution of certain kind of primates, they develop language, and language is already the introduction into the world of normative proprieties. You know, that you can't learn how to speak a language without learning which speech acts are appropriate when. Those are normative considerations. And so the entire world of normative self-regulation emerge. And if, if you think it's a question, how did a natural being like a, an ape develop those capacities? Because th there, there doesn't seem to be any, any appeal. I mean, it invites the neurolinguist to tell us we are almost there. You know, we have an account of consciousness and all of these other issues coming. Uh, yeah, let's just say that from a philosophical point of view, that's a that's a risky bet. I mean, I, I'm not going to hold my breath that they're ever going to figure out how to give us a proposal. I wouldn't be questioned. Big. So anyway, uh, the, the gap here is not a substantive gap. It's just that these beings began to behave in ways that are no longer explicable by appeal to their natural property. They don't suddenly develop non-natural properties. They're still the same embodied beings. It's like, you know, they can play baseball. They can, they can hold themselves to regulation. We don't need a neurophysiological account of how they were able to enter the space of baseball reasons. I mean, they're just the kinds of creatures who, by developing linguistic capacity, could hold themselves to account in various ways that they weren't able to um, before. Um, so uh, 
you know, there's a real difference. There's another big difference here between Heidegger and Hegel, to go, to go back to that. Um, uh, Hegel has a kind of univocal theory of being, of the meaning of being. It's the concept. Uh, for a ridiculous shorthand. Uh, Heidegger, no. They're, they're, Heidegger is the, the proponent of das Nichts. The, the, that what 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 Dasein is is nothing, not a thing. It it it's abgrund. Its its basis uh, is is das das nichts. Um, but that means something quite different. So I'm I'm really sort of triangulating here. Right? There's there's Heidegger, there's Hegel, and there's Zizek Schellingianism. But there's also this Heideggerian notion that Dasein is groundless. That it isn't the kind of being that is a thing whose properties need to be explained. So I, I, I think the whole question of ontology and gap is a category mistake. It misunderstands the problem of human being as a thing that needs to be folded into an account of nature. And since it can't, there's a gap. Well, it doesn't, that 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 inference would follow if Dasein were the kind of thing. That has to be continued. It's the idea is that we're yeah you, you're proposing a non-natural kind of no, not a being at all, not a natural being, not a non-natural being. The entire formulation of what the right way to understand Dasein is has got to be reformulated in terms of this distinct experiential path through life in historical worlds with an awareness of its impending death and a sense of its own groundless, you know, that whole shtick. Um, that's not a gap. That, that's not something that emerged. How did they learn how to play the game of the space of reasons? Well, the same way they eventually developed language and began to hold themselves to accounts of propriety. W what is the problem? I mean, if if you want a neurological explanation, you know, yeah, go go get one. I mean, it's not going to, you're not going to find one, but if, if there's not a neurological explanation, then there's no gap. It's just, you're asking the wrong question about the Geist, Dasein, human being, existence, and so forth. I think I can, can I, 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 thank you for this, really. I, I think I can um, um, uh, immediately connect to this quite well. I mean, there was an interesting debate. Um, you, you you will be far more familiar with that uh, than than uh, we are or, or our listeners are between McDowell and Dreyfus ones, uh, where Dreyfus basically said um, against McDowell, well, you always presuppose the space of reasons, right? Um, uh, but we have to somehow enter the space of reasons. And even more complicated, when we're in the space of reasons, we're not always acting according to normative principles, right? Um, so, and he gives the, the um, uh, I think Dreyfus um, gave the example of a baseball player, like uh, overthinking the move, right? And getting the jibs and then, right? Um, and not, not being able to, to, play professional baseball anymore. Um, um, and and that is an interesting kind of problem. I'm, and I'm not si siding with Dreyfus here at all, but it is an interesting problem, I think, because it it, it raises the question, um, um, what kind of defects we're talking about when we're talking about these kinds of things, right? Um, so how can we... Um, how can we be within a space in which we, at the same time, um, can maybe um, 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 lack, um, or maybe not lack, but 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 how can we be within a space in which we can underperform when we overthink? I think that was Dreyfus's idea, right? So the moment, um, <clears throat> um, so. So the moment we we act with it within it, the most natural, the less thinking, we act the most accordingly, right? Um, the more I underthink riding a bicycle, the better I am in riding the bicycle. Uh, the more I overthink it, 
um, uh, uh, it, I think that debate uh, turned into something like that. But it's interesting because it raises again, I think, the the question um, somehow of other conditions of possibility of entering the space of reason at all, or aren't there? Because um, Argon, uh, sorry, I, I deviate from our plan for for just a moment. Um, but 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 the, I mean, someone I think someone like Zizek would argue nature needs to be what we mean by the concept of nature needs to be something that allows for something to occur in it that at the same time is both absolutely natural nature. For nature, nothing changes with the emergence of human beings and sort of absolutely different because it is the emergence of a being that right now starts caring about its own nature, which, according to Hegel, nature never does, right? I mean, nature doesn't have a concept of itself somehow, um, right? Um, would, would, and, and if one says it's that... Well, I'm not sure if if that's a duality or like a twofold embodiment. Um, and you use that formula yourself, I think, when you right when you speak about um, 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 Hegel's aesthetic. Um, that would just let's say not trivialize the gap, but do something with it. Um, mm. What do you think about that? I mean, I'm I'm sorry, it's very improvised, and therefore. Uh, yeah. Yeah, there are a lot of a, a lot of issues there, but let's go back to the core thing that you mentioned toward the end. Um, here's here's the question: How did nature come to develop, come to come to include within the natural world a being, natural being that began to care about itself in a way that is distinctive in nature? What kind of question is that asking about? I mean. What what would be a satisfying answer? I mean, if it's asking, how is it that a natural being emerged with this capacity? The only answer that you seem to be pointing to is a natural answer. And I gather the point is there isn't one, hence the gap. But what does that explain? I mean, you, you asked an original question, and now you're just saying, well, the answer is the gap. We can't explain it by, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but isn't that the sequence of reasoning that we we want to explain how nature could produce a being that is reflective, that that knows that it's a natural being, and that cares about what it means to be a natural being. And then we ask, how is that possible? And we when we ask that question in the framework of how the natural being could do that, we seem to have only one answer left, or given that there isn't one, we appeal to a, a gap. Why Why wouldn't it be more, um, I mean, this, this goes to, to several different questions on, on the idea of the conceptually uh, informed nature of perception and experience. Um, uh, you know, this Chuck Knobloch example, the second baseman uh, mm. who played for the Yankees and couldn't throw to, couldn't throw to first base that that drive us so much. Of. of course, everybody realizes that actually trying to be a rule following agent when you're playing sports or get you all screwed up. That's not a very deep point. I mean, it's, it's just that through practice and habit and coaching, the actual embodiment of the rule of how to throw a baseball to first base has come to be embodied in the practices. Uh, it doesn't mean that he doesn't, he won't, he can't, because he can't say how he does it, there's nothing conceptual going on. It's just that after practice and habitual usage, he's embodied the correct technique for throwing a ball to first base. And now that he's thinking about it, he's screwing it up uh, for various neurotic and other kinds of self you know, um, performance issue kind of problems. Um, so I don't that that debate. I was there when that debate happened in Berlin, and that just seemed to me a, a non-issue. The, the same thing with the issue of entering the space of reasons. Um, as a human being, there's no the space of reasons doesn't mean in everything I'm doing, I'm thinking all the time of whether I'm justified in doing it or whether I'm doing it right or whether no, it doesn't mean anything like that. As with the as with the baseball example, it 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 means and same thing with Heidegger. 
um, you know, when I, I when I use a tool uh, like a hammer, and I'm not thinking like, what is the right way? Let's see now. I'm supposed to pick it up and I put the nail in and then I hammer it. And of course, that doesn't happen. But I know I'm using a hammer, not a screwdriver. My my perceptual uptake of the world is deeply conceptually informed. It's just that the concept is not functioning as such. It's just so anyway. How is this connected to the space of reasons problem that you asked about? Well, let's take the phrase. You know, what what? How would you enter the space? When does the space of reasons fail? Well, it depends on what you mean by the space of reasons. If 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 you mean um, everything is determined by you know reason giving is a kind of practice that that is its own kind of habitual normal use politeness maxims people saying excuse me or you know it it isn't it isn't a, a, a matter of self conscious appeal to rules and reasons the space of reasons is life Heidegger has no objection to that. What he's really interested in is how did the space of reasons come to matter so much? The 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 way in which appealing to, uh, for example, for the last two hundred years, the central problem in Anglophone political thought has been the legitimacy of the state's monopoly on uh, legitimate force, violence. Well that's to look at the problem of politics and political life from the viewpoint of justifiability of reasons. But it, it, there's no reason to think that's the way in which, what we really want to understand is why the form of life under liberal democracy and, and uh, global finance capitalism has come to have the shape it has such that the reasons we give each other are the ones they are. That's a much more interesting question than how did we get to be able to use reasons? Well, it depends on what you mean by using reasons. And you have to realize that it is it has to do with the historical world in which you're thrown and the way in which things come to count as weighty in an exchange of considerations that people give each other when their actions interfere with what else they were. There's nothing uh, uh, mysterious about that. There, There's no, how did we get to the point where we could do that? apart from the fact that with the entry of language into the human experience, we began to be able to observe proprieties. Now, the posing the question in the way this that you were seems to me to necessarily send us back to an answer in nature we know we can't have, but rather than appeal to a gap, why don't we realize the question we're asking is framed in the wrong way? It makes assumptions about the meaning of being that we have no right to make. Um, can I, can I just, um, um, I think all your points are very, 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 very well taken. Um, 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 I, th and I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to necessarily defend GJAC here at all, but, I th uh, but I think his, um, uh, reading, he tries to defend Hegel here, uh, and maybe that's that's the issue. Um, let let me put it like that, because I think he tries to basically say, and he might hate me for reconstructing him like that, that nature is the concept that thinking forms of that which, as in the end of the logic, with the famous and lesson release bits that. Right, is so so difficult to understand of that which is beyond its own control. Right, thinking cannot derive material existence um, from just an account of thinking, thinking, thinkingly. To speak like Sebastian Rödel, um, what? But that comes with the assumption that there is material natural existence, right? That is non-derivable, and now we do something with it. Um, right, we try to order it into, as Hegel says, into Stufen steps. Um, and part of organizing nature into Stufen, into steps, is an attempt of spirit to understand its own emergence. 
right? Um, in the sequence of logic, nature, spirit. Um, um, and that seems to enable the possibility of looking at nature from different perspectives, namely from the perspective of nature, from the perspective of logic, and from the perspective of spirit, right? I mean, so uh, from the perspective of logic, nature is the thing that cannot be deduced because it's materially there. From the perspective of nature, nature is doesn't have a concept of itself. It's a series of sometimes contingent things. And from the perspective of spirit, it is that which needs to be there for there to be spirit. Right. So, so in this sense, I'm not sure if I, in saying all of this, justified any gap. <laughs> I'm not sure if I did. And maybe we're totally off. Um, but, um, but you see, that, that, that means to um, give an account of some non-derivability and contingency that is somehow in, 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 in there to account for the very emergence of spirit. Um, if spirit is interested in what it is and therefore has to account for its own emergence, that's, that, that, that's, that's what I meant with the question I asked. Um, yeah, I understand. Um, uh, you know, and it's a it's a it's a complicated issue. It goes to, as you say, goes to the end of the logic. But um, uh, I mean, uh, briefly, uh, because to to get into this, we we really need a couple of hours. Um, uh, it's a very very important issue in how to understand uh, how to understand Hegel. First of all, there's no possibility for thinking to deduce the the existence of thinking. There, there's no existential instantiation proof. There's no ontological argument. You know, it, it, Hegel's view of it is just um, that it's it's kind of obvious and nothing to be proven that thinking and being are interrelated in this way. I mean, we've talked about that before. So uh, there's no there's no need. What the logic is about is a conceptual structure, the, the principles of intelligibility of anything at all. It doesn't care where anything at all comes from. The world could be made of gases instead of nature, and it would still have the science of logic as its possible intelligibility, you know, in terms of determinacy, uh, finite limit, uh, essence, nodal line of measure relations, all of it would still apply, whatever it is. So when we come to the end of the logic, um, Hegel was making two assumptions that Kant also makes, um, that uh, there is a natural world, can't deduce it. Um, but again, the prospect of a logic doesn't need to deduce it. Whatever there is must be renderable as intelligible. So given what it is to render anything intelligible, how would the organic and inorganic natural world look given the only way being could be thinkable? That that doesn't seem to me to require a deduction of nature, because there's no deduction of the existence of anything, of thinking, of concepts, of categories. Or, those are not existential categories, and neither is nature. Um, but there's certainly it's certainly the case that Hegel is making use of the empirical discoveries of the natural sciences of his day. He's appealing to them. He doesn't think he needs to deduce them. He just tries to fit them into what empirical observation of the world and its mathematical generalization have provided us in order to demonstrate that the logic is consistent with there being both nature and Geist. So the compatibility of nature and Geist is not that Geist emerges out of nature. It's just that the Logos doesn't, there is no inconsistency given the latter stages of the philosophy of nature and the first stages of the anthropology in the philosophy of right. There is a Co coherent conceptual consistency in the explicability of a world in which there is both nature and geist. So, I mean, there's a lot more to say, and I don't mean to say I, this is a refutation of what you've said. Um, it is it is an unusual problem for Hegel to get from the logic, the realm of shadows, to the actual world, the, the natural world and the historical world. But he doesn't deduce that there's a historical world either. You can't show that Geist has a history as a, an existential 
proposition. There's no deduction of anything like that in Hegel. It's just that anything at all, and we happen to live in a world in which there are natural phenomenon and historical phenomena. Um, I don't see any need for Hegel to try to demonstrate that there couldn't be, this is really what the point of your question as a radical Hegelian enterprise would be, there isn't a Hegelian attempt to show that there couldn't be a world at all were there not natural beings and historical beings. That would be a deductive en entailment. There, there couldn't, in the way Kant proved, there couldn't be a world in which there weren't causal relations of necessary succession. Hegel's not, not, not trying to say there couldn't be a world without nature and Geist, but if there is a world with nature and Geist, its structure is completely intelligible within the framework of the science of logic. That's, that's his position. No, 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 thank you very much for this. I think that is, that's a very precise take. Um, um, sorry for that, I shut up now. Um, oh, no, that's quite interesting. I, I, I don't, I really want to emphasize that's not the end of the issue. There's a lot more to say about this because it's an important problem. Okay, uh, should we, should, let's, let's move on. Um, um, uh, I shut up and, sh shall I shut up or shall I continue? Um, I, I continue, okay. Um, okay. Um, um, throughout your, your entire work, you have been occupied with uh, issues of um, practical, um, social and political um, nature. And therefore, after that Hegel debate we just had, we thought um, we should ask you about um, one of Hegel's greatest pupils, namely Marx. Um, um, what do you, I mean, maybe it's too broad of a question, but nevertheless, broad questions sometimes come with the need of specification and are therefore therefore helpful. What do you make of the Marxist, obviously often rather critical take on Hegel, which nevertheless remains massively indebted? I mean, Marx himself, like in the in in Capital, uh, for example, uh, to Hegel. Do you think there's something broadly speaking in the critique of Hegel's idealism, apart from the in itself? Um, idealist distinction that Hegel, uh, that Engels introduced between idealism and materialism, right? I mean, two concepts, uh, and therefore, right? Um, 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 that's that was the point that allows for the claim that Marx effectuates something like an important, I don't know, addition, supplementation, transformation, uh, something. Um, and you hinted at that uh, earlier, right? I mean, so Hegel, Hegel has serious limitations. Do you think um, that um, while history progressed, um, that 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 Marx is potentially maybe what we need to continue to be Hegelians? Or what is the problem with exactly that type of um, Hegelian continuation in the in the in the Marxist way? Yeah, well, it, in a way, the, the right beginning for this is the same kind of answer with Hegel, that the, the permanent contributions of, of Marx as a critic of capitalism, I mean, the, the concept of uh, the fetishism of commodities, of reification, of uh, alienation, um, the, uh, the internal tensions between stages in which relations of production and means of production don't match up, you know, so the critical capacity of Marx, especially, I mean, if we look at what, you know, the, the, the current state of late capitalism, the, the destruction of the planet, the constant threat of thermonuclear exchange, um, the uh, uh, mass consumer societies, um, pollute kind of popular uh, culture, um, the the, the, the for-profit social media companies that have destroyed the possibility of a common political will formation. Um, it, it, it's, it, Marx is quite right that if you want to know what's going wrong with all, the answer is probably capitalism in terms of liberal democracy and so forth. Uh, uh, but, I mean, to cut to the chase, there's, uh, there's something in, in 
what Marx most got from Hegel, that Hegel is most committed to from phenomenology on, that I think has proven to be um, naive. So the central idea, the, the central idea of dialectic is that there could be in a form of life or an organization of economy um, tensions, um, ways of living out commitments that create consequences that make the continuing sustaining of those commitments impossible. Right? Dialectical self-overcome, right? Uh, Hegel has all kinds of examples of how that's supposed to master bondsman relation being the most prominent, mutually dissatisfied. The master is recognized by someone he doesn't recognize, the slave recognizes someone who doesn't recognize him, and this is intolerable, and it will lead to it's kind of compensatory phenomena like stoicism, skepticism, medieval Christianity, and so forth. Um, and in Marx, you get the idea that um, uh, an unsustainable um, economic condition will necessarily lead to the, it's, I, that, that's just not, it turns out that's not true. I mean, it, 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 when capitalism collapsed in 1929, um, we didn't get a work international workers revolution. We, I mean, for all kinds of reasons, but we, we, we got fascism in Germany, Spain, Italy, Japan, World War II, and so forth. Um, and then in the post, if you ask yourself in the post World War II, Western European, North American world, um, what is the main social bond and the status of the international workers movement? I think the the account that um, the creation of a consumer society so mediated the tension between uh, capital and labor, let's say uh, mediated the immiseration of labor, which is the prediction of Marx uh, as a result of competition and the need for profit and so forth. So it mediated the immiseration of the situation of labor that there is no longer an international workers movement. So when you ask, um, you, know, you know, also the problem of, uh, of immiseration and the gradual degradation of the condition of the working class if that's not the real internal crisis of capitalism what is and again i i i, I think hegel is valuable here in the emphasis on what marx would regard as a as a an epiphenomenon which is this um the invisibility of the worker the humiliation the lack of recognition the um you know, the, the general degrading of the status of labor within a very complex simplification procedure. And now with AI and technology, um, the, the lack of a sustainable life of dignity turns out to be a kind of problem that isn't really a, a, a major economic problem. I mean, it's certainly connected with the economy. But anyway, I think Marx took from Hegel something that for a while was quite valuable, the notion of dialectical self-overcoming and the necessity of a transformation that couldn't be resisted. But after the first third of the 20th century, I don't know what you think about this, but I, I think something that's fundamental happened to the major trajectory of his analysis, even though his critical account of the cultural destructiveness of capitalism seems to me still as accurate as it ever was and to be of some use in trying to figure out how to ameliorate the condition. You know, deaths of despair, opioid uh, death, fentanyl death, uh, su teenage suicide, uh, lower mortality rates, uh, infant mortality. I mean, if, 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 and not to mention the insanity of the last eight years. Uh, you know, is, so in a way, is Marx, the classical marks of any help in understanding Trump. Well, yeah, yeah, I mean, he's a tool of, you know, blah, blah, blah. but there's something much more <laughs> profoundly pathological going on. Let's move to another part of, of, of our uh, discussion. After all, this podcast is called uh, Philosophy and its Other Scene, and we want to examine how your thought relates to one or 
multiple other scenes outside uh, or at the side of uh, uh, philosophy, some scenes that you yourself magisterially uh, uh, dealt, uh, dealt with. To move into this territory, the side of uh, philosophy in a biographical uh, way, and is there not a Nietzschean line about philosophy as, uh, uh, as biography? You uh, mentioned in different occasions that uh, you used to play or you do still play uh, basketball. Uh, is there a relationship? And if so, uh, what kind of relationship is there for you between philosophy and, uh, and sports? If uh, it doesn't have to be basketball, but you know, uh, uh, for Plato and others, uh, sportive uh, activity uh, and gymnastics have been an essential component of any uh, philosophical account of, uh, of uh, education. Is there any inherent link uh, for you between uh, philosophy and sport? Well, that's, I, you know, I'm 75 years old. That's the first time I've ever been asked that question. <laughs> so it's just a, a kind of a historic moment for me. I, um, uh, I had a teacher in college uh, who was my first teacher in Heidegger, a man named Drew uh, Highland, who um, was a, uh, had been a, you know, a, a, a varsity basketball player at Princeton. Um, and was an avid skier and so forth. And he, um, he made a point that is perhaps relevant to what you're, you're asking about. He thought, you know, philosophy, uh, is, it goes in line with this Heideggerian shift that from, from analysis as the task of philosophy to interpretation. So philosophy should make available to you a way of thinking about things that have come to be like peak experiences or intense experiences, things that are revelatory about yourself that you might not have known otherwise, things that are revelatory about your views and relations with other human beings, things that might be relevant to what you ultimately care about that would show up in one intense context and would in another. And that for a lot of people, who are talented enough to do well in sports, which is a major limitation, certainly a major limitation of mine when I play basketball. Um, uh, this is one way of thinking about philosophy. Um, you know, that it doesn't have a kind of dogmatic doctrinal mission. It's much more Socratic, it's self-examination. And th th there is this Heideggerian, sports can reveal to you as do a lot of other peak experiences, what's important to you, what matters. And it can reveal to you things that matter to you that you wish didn't matter to you, but that that do. And there are things you thought that did matter to you that it turns out when push comes to show it doesn't really matter to you. So there is there is something about about sport and its relation to philosophy that gives you a kind of picture of the kinds of things philosophy can be useful for that don't fit into the academic framework of philosophy, this interpretive depth problem. How do I get to um, why I didn't pass the ball to that guy when he was open? <laughs> yeah, that kind of thing. And, it, and took that wild shot myself. So uh, the whole process of self-examination and um, self-knowledge, um, since self-knowledge is not kind of an observational inner sense kind of thing, um, these engagements with other human beings that are so intense can be, to go back to a word we've used before, revelatory, disclosive. But I am, I mean, with my arthritic knees and bad back, I have, I can't even run anymore. So <laughs> it's been a long time since I experienced, I experienced this intensity now only watching uh, television. <laughs> I mean, to, uh, that, that's a good follow-up, I think, um, uh, to, and to take up like one of your your uh, book titles uh, about doing philosophy with other means. I mean, um, is there anything in, it, it might be a very conjunctural question, but nevertheless, uh, in the recent uh, movie culture that did strike you as, I mean, as you were an eminent philosophical film sc uh, scholar, as uh, particularly interesting or thought-provoking. I mean, we were thinking, obviously, about 
things that have been discussed quite widely, like Oppenheimer, Barbie, or something slightly more niche, but not really like Bo is Afraid, which is, I mean, a very odd movie uh, for Hollywood to produce. I mean, or maybe something that's not even on our radar. Is there something that recently sparked uh, your your interests or reflections? Well, I did see Oppenheimer. I did see Barbie. I did see uh, Killers of the Flower Moon. Um, but I had I wouldn't say that. Um, I mean, the last film I found interesting. I mean, it was a very typical Scorsese, undisciplined, un unstructured, uh, uh, poorly thought out, too long. You know, a lot of a lot of Scorsese is, is like that. But it raised this uh, interesting question about um, culpability and its relationship to stupidity, um, because the central character, Eugene, the DiCaprio character, um, is clearly too stupid in a way, makes it even credible to think he's too stupid to understand the wrong, even as he's poisoning his own wife. So, uh, spoiler alert. Um, uh, actually, too, too stupid to realize the exact nature of the wrongness because he believes his uncle, the De Niro character, must know the right thing to do. Uh, and there's this eerie sense of plausibility to the, the idea that um, somebody can come so far under the control of someone without having the mental resources to know how to resist. That struck me as uh, kind of a minor political analog to what's going on in the United States and to some extent in Britain, that there are uh, people whose, whose moral uh, compass has just gone off kilter because they don't have actually the resources to bring it bring it back, especially get, given that social media has created these silo experiences where you are never exposed to any information that might shake up. But anyway, I found that quite interesting. I don't know if it was delivered by Scorsese or not, I doubt it. Oppenheimer, I had just read American Fair uh, Prometheus, so I was disappointed because uh, the picture of Oppenheimer is very one-sided. Oppenheimer was a kind of party animal. He was uh, he was not this doer, um, you know, constantly thinking about the future of the world and the, the destruction of it. I mean, he, those those guys were, they were in their 20s and 30s. They were having parties every night. They were jumping from bed to bed. There was all kinds of affairs. I mean, Oppenheimer himself was, uh, you know, not the most faithful of husbands. And the whole thing at, at Los Alamos was a much more fervid environment that would have been wonderful to film. But Oppenheimer just sort of solemnly went through each of the major events in his life as if it were a kind of documentary. Barbie, I thought, was kind of silly. It was a, a throwback to 70s feminism, and um, all of it was really cliched, 70s feminism. But, you know, my wife tells me 10-year-old girls need to hear that every generation, so it'd be a good thing no matter. But I, I didn't think it was a very interesting, uh, a very interesting movie. Um, and bizarre in in it being accepted as a kind of culturally important movie when it's a two hour advertisement for Mattel. Um, they they really the the only criticism of uh, you know the industry is really cliched and but you know. Barbie was a horrible thing. <laughs> it just it wasn't it wasn't like yeah. Well, there was a doll, and yeah, maybe it was a little sexist or anything else. It was, it was absolutely god awful presentation of women. And so here we have this this you know just think of the way uh, Margot Robbie the, the first moment of the movie. You know what have they done to deflect the body image problem and the you know the the fantasy of ideal beauty but nothing they, 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 once you see the first moment you, you first of all your breath is taken away she's so beautiful and then you think wait a minute <laughs> how is this going to be critical of barbie when you got the main actress who plays barbie looking at, and probably being the most beautiful woman in the world so i thought it was a very strangely contradictory 
experience for feminists to glom onto and say, you know, the people who look like Barbie can be corporate executives. Well, yeah, but and where where's the fat Barbie? Where's the pimply faced Barbie? Where's the disabled Barbie? Well, they now have disabled Barbie, but it's all like tokenism. We all know that what Barbie's supposed to look anyway. I'm rambling on, but you asked about Barbie. So no, I'm writing a book on Robert Bresson. So I have been doing nothing but for the last two or three years, watching over and over again, the 13 films made by Robert Bresson, who I think is uh, one of the four or five greatest filmmakers, underappreciated. That's all I've been watching for movies. Oh, and some Hanukkah. I do, I do like Hanukkah results and the films of the Dardenne brothers. Uh, the, which I would recommend to anybody who, again, given the kind of disclosure of the analysis of the invisibility of migrant and uh, illegal or unempowered labor, the actual psychological situation of people whose status in the labor market is precarious, which is now an enormous number of people, then I, the Dardens can tell us more about what that's like than any sociological analysis. An acquaintance of mine, not really a friend, plays in one of their their films. Uh, I forgot both the name of the film and the name of of her character, but the actress is called Orta Dobroshi. I think you've you have. Oh written, yeah, that's uh, Lorna, Lorna Silence. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, Lorna Silence. Yeah, that, that's a wonderful film. And it is, is it exactly this moment of resistance. Yeah. You know, even as she's being partic participated in it, um, costs her a great deal. Yeah. Frank, you should see that film if you if you if you haven't uh, so far. I think it's I, I really think it's worth uh, worth watching. I know it. Oh yeah. Okay. All right. Good. <laughs> I just I, I just wrote a piece on the failure of recognition as an issue, a gay Hegelian issue in Rosetta, which is their uh, huh. first film, um, which has a very kind of Hegelian structure. The the less recognized she is, the more she sort of regresses to a near feral animal existence. I don't know if you've seen it, but uh, Another first-time actress, uh, absolutely wonderful. Not not an actress, you know, a first-time amateur, but it it really plays on the theme of what the contemporary failure of recognition in the modern labor force does to people, does to their families, their drug use, their friendships, their competition with each other. Anyway, those are the movies that I've, I've been thinking about. So to move to another and the last uh, scene, uh, contemporary politics. Uh, in the US, there are soon to be primaries in the Republican Party, and it seems Trump will most likely win and thus be uh, nominated against, presumably, the incumbent uh, President Biden. According to some polls, uh, Trump is leading by a rather small uh, margin, but nonetheless, he is, uh, he is uh, leading. What is your prediction, if we may, uh, if we may ask, of how this uh, this will play uh, will play out? How do you see and uh, how do you explain the Trump uh, phenomenon and the shift of the Republicans to a far right, all right uh, uh, party? Do you think that the failure of uh, of the Democrats to represent or be the voice of the working class, the unemployed poor? Uh, to present themselves in some sort of social democratic uh, within a, some some sort of a social democratic platform is what enabled or contributed uh, to the emergence and the rise of the uh, of the Trump uh, phenomenon, or do you, you think the the the, the issue lies uh, elsewhere? Uh, some have spoken of an exhaustion of the at least Western parliamentary. Uh, uh, system. We are curious to hear what you think of this present uh, conjuncture, so to speak. Yeah, uh, you know, I, um, I, I don't think I, I, I wish I did have a, just a strikingly brilliant elucidation of why, why, why Trump. I mean, a, a couple of things do occur to me that, there, you know, the, uh, the the support for Trump on Wall Street is um, profound. Uh, so you have to look beyond 
I mean, the, the, in a way, there's a kind of screen phenomenon here. The illusion is that these, you know, white evangelicals who are screaming their heads off at their rallies, that they're really what's behind Trump. But the first thing Trump did after he got elected was engineer this unbelievable tax cut for um, the upper 1%, which led to an incredible increase in inequality, um, in financial inequality that, that has, we're just now recovering a bit from thanks to Biden to some extent. Um, so uh, I, I, I think, the number of voters who vote for Trump by holding their nose and thinking, this is in my self-interest, um, coupled with the people who are worried about, you know, I mean, all the things people say about the anxieties of the white working class, and the connection between that issue and immigration and racism, that that all seems to be true. But the, the problem right now, I think politically is not so much, how can we explain you know, the persistence of this unbelievably stupid, evil, treacherous, betraying moron as presidential material. Um, but what? why is there so little Democratic resistance? I mean, the, the recent elections made clear that the abortion thing will help Democrats uh, quite a lot. That, uh, that, that's, that's one thing to hope for. But on the economy, you know, uh, inflation last summer, summer of 22, was 9 point something percent. It's 3.7 percent now. The problem is the prices don't go back down; they just don't keep increasing. So people still see, you know, even though gas prices used to be five dollars and now three forty a dollar in America, um, uh, and um, uh, growth GDP is 4.9 percent. It's extraordinary. I mean, capitalism needs three to five percent to survive, and it's flourishing. Mm -hmm. um, stock market's in good shape. Uh, uh, we've recovered 25% of the income inequality that was caused by the Trump um, tax cut and the pandemic. So the economy is thriving. The reason Democrats, they can't put Biden out in front of an audience where he just coolly and methodically ticks these figures off and just forcefully says, you know, you're wrong. The economy isn't great because if they expose him, He'll have, there'll have to be questions. And if you saw the press conference in Vietnam about a month ago, um, he was dangerously incoherent. Uh, so the Democrats, I don't know how it looks from Europe, but uh, most of our problems are, are uh, in resisting Trump, who's facing so many problems that if we had a credible candidate and a credible message, um, we'd be doing much better. It's just, you know, Biden has done a lot of good things, but, you know, he sort of promised he would do this and get out of the way. And then he changed his mind. And now, given that he's so old and he's so infirm, and the last year, especially, he's gotten much worse. And there's widespread disaffection with Kamala Harris. So, you know, what are they going to do if, they, if, if, if Biden decides not to run? It has to be Kamala Harris or they lose a huge segment of their of their base. So, I mean, some people have these scenarios where he appoints her like UN ambassador or something and she doesn't run and there's an open primary, but it looks like they're gonna run with Biden. And uh, if Trump isn't convicted and in jail, which is our only hope, Trump will probably be reelected. Uh, and then he'll, as it, you know, the Washington Post reported, he'll start politicizing the Justice Department, uh, throwing people in jail, uh, He'll initiate the uh, the military, the, the 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 Insurrection Act. I don't know if you've been following this, but uh, Trump plans on the first day after um, there's a, there's a there's a an 1870s law that the, the the president can call on the military for policing powers in the United States um, if there's a threat of civil disintegration, and it's it's been used by um, it was used by Kennedy, and it was used by Johnson, G. Kennedy in, in Little Rock, and Johnson for school desegregation, National Guard troops. Well, Trump is going to institute the Insurrection Act as a permanent feature of American uh, policing life. So he's going to send federal troops 
into cities to break up demonstrations. That's what he wanted to do during the George Floyd period. He wanted uh, the military mildly resisted, but he's now promised he will court martial mildly. You know, he, he'll, the Justice Department will. Uh, so it, it will be a terrible thing if he gets elected. And I'm very, very, very worried because the opposition on the Democratic side and what they're actually proposing is, is, is reasonable. I mean, his economic reforms and the way he's invested the trillions of dollars of the Infrastructure Act are quite intelligent, quite reasonable, and they are improving the condition of working class Americans. But he can't publicly, apparently, he, he, he's not competent to do this coherently and logically and forcefully in a way that would generate any enthusiasm. So people are going to stay home and, and Trump will win with 44 percent of the vote. So he won the electoral college. We'll all go to hell in a handbasket. But I don't, I mean, if you have a view of why at this point in the history of capitalism, um, we should have our own Berlusconi, Berlusconi. Uh, why, why the Italians had to have their own Berlusconi. And if there's a kind of, and, and, and Boris Johnson, or, you know, we're in the era of buffoons. And if there's a, a very clever Marxist analysis of why capitalism now needs buffoons, I suspect there is, but I don't know what it is. Um, ending on and in the era of buffoons and um, obscene masters, maybe, um, uh, we end the podcast usually with a series of either or questions. Um, they are not necessarily uh, comfortable ones or not necessarily always consistent ones, but, um, and you can refuse to, you you can refuse the choice. Uh, you can elaborate, but you can't, uh, but you don't have to at all. But uh, I'm, I'm gonna read 10 uh, to you and I'm aware. We, we will be awaiting your answer or your non-answer. Um, so would you either go for Plato or Aristotle? Now, what do you mean by this question? I mean, if 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 I could have a world in which one of those never existed, which one would it be? <laughs> oh, that's a good that, that's a good rendering. Yes. Would you rather live in an Aristotelian or in a Platonist world? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> okay. If 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 you're asking me, when I first started doing philosophy, uh, what really stirred my heart was it metaphysics, gamma in Aristotle or Plato's symposium. Yes. It was it was Plato. Okay. Um, I, I'll take the poet over the empiricist. <laughs> um. I'm relieved and uh, happy to hear that. Heidegger or Nietzsche? That's a tricky one. Um, both have the problem. I mean, Nietzsche, uh, Nietzsche's analysis of the psychological uh, collapse of, of uh, commitment to anything substantial is as powerful as anything I know of in the history of philosophy and his rhetoric. But at the end of the day, Nietzsche still believes that our only hope is for an elite to culturally transform the zeitgeist. I mean, the Wagner thing was a mistake, but he continued to believe that, that our only hope was for, he had, he had no hope for a, a, a full-scale transformation of what has become an, a, a much more banal and uh, superficial and um, manipulated culture, uh, except by virtue of this sort of leading elite. Um, and, you know, of course, Heidegger, Heidegger drew his own. There, there's something quite dangerous about uh, philosophers who believe we're in a catastrophic or critical situation. Um, this goes back to the issue of, of gaps, by the way, because uh -huh. some of this business leads to Badiou, um, worry about you know, there being no way to be A to B, so you just do it. You just have to decide. You just have... So it, 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 this comes from Heidegger, comes from Nietzsche. Uh, there is no way of thinking ourselves into the right solution, so just jump. 
Um, so on the, on the sort of strength of philosophical depth, I, I think I'd have to take uh, either, but uh, I'm worried about both of them because mm -hmm. of um, the, the danger of misinferring what should be done given that things are not going very well. Hegel or Nietzsche to make it even more difficult, maybe. Um, well, well, I gave some lectures in Paris once in, uh, on Nietzsche, and I said, well, you know, my general is for a couple of years, I'll work on Hegel, and I'll think there's there are ways for the world to overcome its own self-limitations. And then that just seems ridiculous, and I read Nietzsche for a couple of years. So <laughs> I, 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 think we need, I think we need both. Uh, okay. Um, um, you have given the account of modernity in some uh, sense as a tragic form. So tragedy or comedy? Tragedy. Um, I, think you, I think you need a... Comedy requires a kind of divine perspective. I'll give you an example. Um, German philosopher once told me, you know, you get to be 70 or so, and it's a wonderful thing because you're kind of... You withdraw from life. People don't pay as much attention to you. You can just observe like a god. You just... You, it looks like a comedy. It's just a great human comedy. <laughs> But then you have grandchildren, and they <laughs> pull you right back. Just, <laughs> I have two grandchildren. <laughs> vengeance or fate? Uh, well, certainly not vengeance. I guess fate. I don't know. I, I, vengeance doesn't. I don't. I don't quite get the, the contrast. But uh, yeah. vengeance is an ugly word. Um, Wells or Eisenstein? Wells or Eisenstein? Yeah. Oh, gosh. Do I have to choose those? <laughs> no, you don't. I mean, you can take both, though. So. Take, I'll take both. I'll throw in John Ford. I'll throw in uh, uh, Fritz Long. I'll throw in... <laughs> um, critical revision or revolution? Well, it depends on what you mean by revolution. If you mean getting control of tanks and helicopters, it's not going to happen. Uh, so, but if you mean something like uh, a complete transformation in the way philosophy is done in universities, uh, I would be in favor of a revolution. I don't, I don't think there's anything on the trajectory of current academic philosophy that's going anywhere. And if the if the crisis gets to a certain point, there can be a complete trend. I mean, you had a question about analytic and continental philosophy. That, I mean, right now there's neither one. You know, there, there really isn't a successor to the Heidegger, Sartre, Foucault, mm -hmm. Derrida, Levinas. That, that just sort of petered out. And in analytic philosophy, after Quine, they basically demonstrated there was no such thing as analysis. Mm -hmm. um, uh, analytic philosophy is sort of limping along as a kind of philosophy of science. Kind of so anyway. One last one. Poetry or philosophy? Yeah, poetic philosophy is what we need. Yeah. Thank you. Dialectical, so dialectical synthesis. <laughs> Thank you so much, Robert, <laughs> uh, for this. This was really amazing. Um, and yeah. absolutely. So will you, you put this on YouTube? Yes, we yes. will. We'll send you the link. Thank you so much okay. for doing this. It was it was we really enjoyed this. A lot of fun. Thank you for asking me. Um, Have a great care. day. You too. Bye bye. bye.